Uh, so the next talk is uh, Mr. Joe Sullivan. And uh, for those of you who don't know Joe, um, Joe is an attorney at uh, Sullivan Richards. He's a, a partner there. Uh, that's a law firm based here in Seattle. Does, uh, I think, exclusively at this point, fisheries-based work. Uh, when I describe Joe to folks, I describe him as the godfather of the harvesting cooperative model. And uh, he's done a lot of work in setting up a, a private-based fisheries institutions that have proven to be quite powerful in achieving a lot of things. When you're listening to Joe's talk, think of this as really a transition point between what we just heard with the directors and uh, Steve um, about the management response into a transition about what private industry is doing and how private industry and private institutions can uh, manage with these requirements. I think you'll find this fascinating. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Merrick. Uh, pardon me if I'm not looking up very often. Uh, the light from the back booth makes me feel a little bit like I'm headed down a tunnel here, so I'm going to kind of duck occasionally in order to be able to see what I'm uh, doing. Uh, I think this is a great pivot point from National Standard 1's obligations to attain OY well, preventing overfishing to how do we actually do that in practice. And uh, that goal can be achieved uh, with some level, of course, of uncertainty and inefficiency by limiting entry, limiting durations of seasons, uh, setting seasonal catch limits, and so on, as, as has been discussed. But even when that's going on, in every case, fishermen have an incentive to find a workaround that improves their ability to compete relative to other harvesters. And the result is what's, what economists refer to as rent dissipation. In other words, putting a whole lot of extra effort into harvesting and processing capacity than the amount of catch that's available will actually support. And there's an increased risk that the tack that you've set in order to meet your national standard one obligations is going to be exceeded because you have pulse fisheries, like 24-hour halibut periods. And you're doing your accounting after that catch has taken place and been delivered, and you're hoping that you're within, in, in that case, the guideline harvest level, or the GHL. And as Steve noted, allocating harvest shares uh, really uh, now is, would realign those incentives, it is, is explicitly designed to realign those incentives so that uh, what you're hoping is fishermen and uh, the other stakeholders in the fishery are seeking to employ the appropriate amount of effort in order to catch the allocation that's been made available to them. And there's an increased ability as a result of allocating those harvest shares to actually monitor and measure the catch that is available. So how do we do that? How do we allocate harvest shares? I think coming into uh, kind of the current period of uh, fishery management, the default assumption was that we would uh, basically go down the individual fishing quota road, that government would uh, basically enter the field, that government would uh, work up an allocation formula that would allocate quotas among participants, and then those participants would basically be held to, uh, by government action, harvesting no more than the quota that was made available to them. Let me go back a second. However, the, the first program probably maybe not the first program at time, but the first program in terms of major significance surfaced some really complex issues. The halibut and sablefish individual fishing program, which was implemented in 1993, had just by necessity distributional effects among fishermen and communities. And uh, there were serious concerns about that and also about the uh, effect of the transitional gain associated with improving the, the character of the fishing privileges, uh, potentially creating a barrier or at least a restriction on new entry into the fishery. And there was a strong political and social backlash that was strong enough that it culminated in an MSA moratorium on IFQs from 1996 to 2004. So, we get to what I'd call rationalization 2.0. We're in the situation where this controversy has brewed up. Uh, the moratorium is, is about to be implemented as a result of it. 
and we uh, enter, and then we take a look now at what, what was going on during that period of time in the whiting fishery setting. Uh, in 1996, the catcher processor sector of the Pacific whiting fishery had a secure sector allocation. It had a license limitation program that restricted new entry. It had a small number of participants, four, uh, who had functional working relationships and a relatively high degree of trust in each other. There was this, notwithstanding that, there was a substantial uh, amount of excess harvesting and processing capacity employed in the fishery, which had culminated in a race for fish. Product recovery rates, uh, product mix, product quality were all suboptimal. And because of the effects of the race for fish, NIMS was retaining buffer quota to reduce the risk that competition for catch coupled with delays in governmental uh, catch monitoring and accounting would result in the total allowable catch being exceeded. The Whiting Conservation Cooperative was formed in early 1997 as a membership organization composed of those four companies participating in the catcher processor sector. And its members negotiated and contractually allocated sector harvest shares while agreeing to conduct their processing, their marketing, and their other sales under an unrestrained, in unrestrained competition with each other. Excess capacity was removed immediately. Fishery harvest rates slowed, product recovery, product mix, and product quality all improved substantially. Accurate catch accounting through a private monitoring and accounting service, C-State Inc., uh, it, coupled with careful catch management, gave NIMS confidence that the buffer quota was unnecessary and it was released back to the fishery. Uh, having allocated harvest shares, sector participants had less incentive to hoard the time, area, method, and means information that could be used otherwise to compete with each other in a, in a race for fish. And while overall catch rates of non-target species were very low. The sector had two species, yellowtail rockfish and salmon uh, bycatch, were of significant concern to governmental fishery managers. In response to this sensitivity, the fleet used sea state services to collect and exchange information concerning areas of relatively high encounter rates for the two species, and it was able to substantially reduce its incidental catch rates. So we see here that the uh, catch monitoring, catch reporting, and enforcement structure developed for allocating harvest shares is the, the ready platform here for bycatch avoidance. So now we'll move from a simple bycatch avoidance uh, approach to a uh, much more complicated management approach to dealing with salmon bycatch. The Bering Sea salmon bycatch in the Bering Sea pollock fishery is a very thorny problem. Uh, the discrete areas that it might make sense to close today may be the very areas where you would like to have people fishing tomorrow. Uh, there's a tremendous degree of variability in where the salmon show up at any given point in time during the season and season to season. The large zones that would encompass the historic areas of elevated interaction or bycatch uh, over multiple years, the kind of conservation areas that you might build if you're just saying, let's be safe and just make sure we put together something along, some of the, along the lines of the RCA that was described in the earlier presentation, uh, are not only huge and basically have a tremendous impact on the catch of uh, the target stock of Pollock, but frankly, they have the same problem in the sense that, of variability, in the sense that what we actually found is in some years, those conservation areas actually had uh, lower rates of salmon bycatch than areas outside the conservation areas. And so they were actually confounding. Uh, the time cycle for developing regulations that could actually do discrete area closures on kind of a real-time or rolling-time basis that could address this problem is simply uh, also confounding with respect to this problem because there, the amount of time it takes to develop a fishery management plan analysis and amendment or even a regulatory amendment that would address a change in closure areas is so long relative to the change, the time that it takes for the patterns of bycatch to change that you simply can't ever get there. There is no way to do it on a basis that makes sense. 
So the numbers uh, in, uh, just so you have a flavor of what we're talking about here, in the periods that we'll, uh, ref we'll note in connection with the uh, FMP amendments we'll describe next, uh, 92 to 2001, average bycatch rate of 32,482 Chinook. 2002 to 2007, considered a period of elevated bycatch. We're still, at, uh, even when the bycatch is in the range of 74,000 plus or minus Chinook, the rate is 52 per thousand metric tons of pollock. This is an extraordinarily low rate. In 2007, we had a spike and we had bycatch of approximately 122,000 Chinook. The responses to this uh, bycatch rate. The North Pacific Fishery Management Council adopted Amendment 21B in 1995, established a, an area that uh, basically encompassed uh, the historic areas of elevated bycatch and set a trigger amount of 48,000 Chinook, which if reached before April 15th, would close that area for the remainder of the period up to April 15th. And that's because typically Chinook bycatch is quite high at, in relative terms at the beginning of the year and then tapers off after that. Uh, then uh, we have Amendment 58, which came along in response to both increasing concerns on the part of Western Alaskan users who place a very high uh, cultural, social value on Chinook as well as commercial value. Uh, and at the same time, the sense the council had that there were new opportunities to be uh, pursued here. In 1998, the American Fisheries Act took effect and the Bering Sea uh, Pollock Catcher Processor Fleet formed two sector harvesting cooperatives uh, whose membership comprised all but one vessel in the sector, and the pollock catcher vessels delivering to shore plants and motherships formed harvesting cooperatives the following year, in 2000. The council knew this process was going on, and I think there, it was their belief that given these new tools that were available to the fleet, and given some of the experience that they had had with the Pacific whiting fishery, that there was uh, an expectation that the fleet could find new tools to address this issue. And so we have Amendment 58, which reduced the trigger to 29,000 uh, Chinook and realigned the salmon savings areas to match more current information. And sure enough, in 2002, the uh, Pollock Intercooperative, in other words, a group of Pollock harvesting cooperatives that basically represented all of the effort in the fishery, uh, implemented a voluntary rolling hotspot program. Now, this, is, this gets us to risk management right off the bat here. This was to reduce the risk of closing this redesigned Chinook Salmon Savings Area, which would have had very significant impacts on the catch per unit of effort for the fleet. What the fleet did was uh, develop a contractual arrangement among cooperatives that would establish closures on an ongoing basis, weekly basis, and they were redesigned every week based on the bycatch information that was coming into the fleet, uh, that were discreet, that were carefully tailored to the experience on the grounds, and access to those areas was based on a, co on a cooperative's relative bycatch performance. The better its bycatch performance, the greater its access. The worst its performance, the less, and the lowest tier in terms of uh, those uh, having the best performance would get almost full-time access, the highest tier in terms of those having the highest bycatch rates and the poorest performance, would get no access to these areas. Uh, this was implemented in 2002, and uh, it's actually still in place. It's been wrapped into some other programs that we'll talk about, but it's still a very important component of what goes on in that fishery. In my mind, what follows next in 2005, Amendment 84 is probably one of the most significant developments in many respects in, in North Pacific and Pacific Coast management in the sense that the North Pacific Council picked up the voluntary rolling hotspot program, recognized it as an explicit part of bycatch management in the Bering Sea pollock fishery, and included it into the suite of regulations as an element that would uh, be an explicit part of how the pro problem was addressed on a regulatory basis going forward. The, in simple terms, the vessels operating under a voluntary rolling hotspot plan that met certain performance standards that were set by the council 
were exempted from the regulatory Chinook salmon savings area closure if it were triggered. And so now this, this contractual arrangement really gave the fleet the ability to address the risk of the regulatory area closure and then led to the reward of access to areas where, frankly, there could well be cleaner fishing, uh, lower salmon bycatch rates if they were operating under their own contractual arrangement that met the performance standards that were appropriate. Uh, Amendment 91, uh, I think, is in many respects uh, a response to the elevated bycatch rates that we saw toward the uh, end of the period that I gave you. And, and uh, it, the council decided that it was necessary in, for many reasons to actually impose a hard cap on uh, Chinook salmon in the Bering Sea, Chinook salmon bycatch. Uh, the cap is, as I mentioned, a three-tiered regulatory cap. Uh, it is based on uh, an approach where you get access to a higher cap, higher regulatory cap, if you're part of a fleet group that adopts an incentive plan agreement that is designed to reduce, provide incentives to reduce salmon bycatch at all levels of abundance. So now we've moved beyond Amendment 84, where we had the blending of the two approaches to a, an actual approach where the council is saying, we will reward you further. We're going to impose a high cap, but we'll reward you further if you actually think freely and develop some type of incentive plan that's going to actually uh, address this issue. Uh, by the way, the bycatch rates have been substantially lower since the period that I uh, identified for you. And since then, one other very interesting development, the council now takes annual reports from the cooperatives on their salmon bycatch performance. And so there's a dialogue, a, an annual dialogue that's developed. Uh, as the fleet reports on how they're addressing these issues, the council suggests ways that they might tweak it. And we're moving into what I consider a very sophisticated relationship between the council and the fleet with respect to this very difficult issue. So now we'll turn back to the Pacific Coast Groundfish IFQ program. And uh, this picks up where Steve left off on some of the complex issues related to the uh, character of that fishery and the status of some of the constraining species in that fishery. Uh, the uh, Pacific Groundfish fishery has been rationalized under amendment, Amendments 20 and 21, which were implemented, implemented pardon me, in December of 2010. The inshore sector is managed under a fairly traditional IFQ program, and it also includes individual bycatch allocations for halibut. The constraining species that Steve was talking about earlier uh, have generated very, very small allocations of individual fishing quota. Uh, I think in the case of uh, yellow eye rockfish in the first year, we're talking about coastwide 1,600 pounds being allocated across the fleet. And their, uh, the allocation was very thin and very patchy in the sense that not only were people getting small amounts, everybody was getting a very small amount of that total, but the allocation was based on catch of uh, yellow eye as bycatch during a base period. Some people had no bycatch, they got no allocation. Uh, so it was a very kind of difficult allocation that uh, to use under a system where you're going to count on trades in quota pounds to somehow resolve issues regarding uh, bycatch incidents. The, uh, and specifically, to be clear here, under the IFQ program, a person can't fish if they have a quota pound deficit. In other words, if they get quota, they get quota pounds at the beginning of the year that represent their share of allocated species, if at any point they exceed any one of those allocations, they can't fish until they obtain an amount of quota pounds necessary to bring their account back to zero. And so given the small amount that's been allocated, most fishermen face a significant risk of exceeding their constraining species QP allocation and exceeding it even when they don't intend to. There are two potential sources for, uh, from which a fisherman could obtain the constraining species quota necessary to cover a deficit. You know, one approach would be the, the classic kind of market approach where you say, well, go find somebody who has some and work out a deal. Uh, the other that we'll talk about further is a risk pool arrangement under 
uh, you form essentially an insurance pool, and it provides insurance for its members against those kinds of events. Under the pure market model, uh, there are a number of real serious problems, at least those of us who participated in the formation of the risk pool uh, feel there were. Uh, first off, these constraining species catch events are not entirely predictable. The catch volumes per event can vary widely. The bottom line is active fishermen uh, who are in the, out on the grounds are unlikely to make constraining species QP available to anybody else, even if they have an amount that could potentially be surplus, because they won't know if, whether or not they need it until the last toe of the year. So the guy who's caught mid-year is going to have a very difficult find, find, time finding anything on the market. Uh, constraining species QP might be available from QHS holders who've decided not to fish, and there are quite a number of those because the fishery was substantially overcapitalized, but you can see the problem that's developing. Uh, this could result in a pretty substantial transfer of ground fish resource rent from active fishermen to folks who are sitting on shore with an allocation and basically collecting uh, the rent associated with that. And then the patchy distribution, the thin and patchy distribution of these species presents some really significant uh, equity issues. Uh, ironically, fishermen who are conducting the cleanest fishing operations during the quota share calculation base years were rewarded with the lowest allocations. And they considered that something other than just ironic. Uh, <laughs> there, there are also some macro distributional issues in the sense that the communities like Fort Bragg that had extended periods of participation in the groundfish fishery had a great fleet, a matter of fact, a fleet that fished cleanest probably of any community's fleet or cleaner than most community's fleets on the coast, it received in the aggregate such a low allocation of quota ponds for these constraining species that the entire community's fishery, ground fish fishery economy was at risk. And so it's at both levels you have these really serious problems that frankly then contribute to instability of the entire program that's designed to address the issue that you're trying to address in the first place. So Last point, on, in terms of the issues here, the other problem also is the fishermen have an incentive to hoard bycatch information. If you're in a quota pound trading market, uh, you don't want to share information avoiding, uh, about how to avoid these constraining species. What you're doing is keeping that to yourself, using it for your best advantage, and what you're hoping, frankly, is that one of your competitors may have an issue. He comes to you to ask for some quota pounds for the constraining species, and your response is, well, I'd rather have your target species quota pounds. How about that? And there were people in the fishery who actually had gamed that out and were prepared to play that strategy. So there were some pretty serious problems at this point. Uh, in response to this problem, uh, and I want to credit Merrick because he was heavily involved in this and frankly I think he had the foresight to see this problem coming while he was still an analyst with the Pacific Council. There are explicit references in the Council documents to the formation of risk pools and he was heavily involved in the development of these pools. Thank you. The, uh, the, what was formed is what's called the California Risk Pool. Uh, members are three fishing associations, uh, each uh, Central Coast Seafood Marketing Association, Fort Bragg Groundfish Association, Half Moon Bay Groundfish Marketing Associations. Uh, they form a risk pool advisory committee. It approves uh, fishing plans that uh, for each of the, the member uh, associations in their areas. The goal of each fishing plan is to promote, to promote the long-term success of the fishery and it's supporting port communities by maximizing the harvest of target species from the fishery, minimizing the take of constraining species, safeguarding sensitive fish habitat, and contributing to the rebuilding of constraining species stocks. And each of these factors has equal importance in their fishing plans. Uh, the uh, advisory committee that's established by the group uh, approves the fishing plans. They're very specific regarding how the fishery will be conducted. And then, if uh, the, quota, the constraining species use under a fishing plan exceeds their projections, there's an obligation on the part of the association to amend its fishing plan uh, 
accordingly, so an obligation to adapt, and if, a if the association fails to do so, the advisory committee actually has the authority to take that on. In the interim period while the plan, uh, fishing plan amendment is being developed, uh, restricted fishing orders are adopted as placeholders that basically are intended to, to keep things as in best shape possible as they're moving forward with that plan. Consistent with this voluntary rolling hotspot system, this is a highly adaptive system and it's one that certainly wouldn't be attainable through normal command and control regulations. Uh, notably, the fishing plans contain regional rules. So each association develops the rules for its region where it has the greatest amount of experience and the greatest amount of investment. Vessels that fish uh, among the pool uh, communities have to comply with the rules that are adopted by the association that has jurisdiction over the region where the vessel is actually operating. So the local rules are the rules that you play under. Uh, each association is required to monitor its vessel's locations, inform itself concerning the rules of that region in which they're operating, and it has the primary responsibility to take, uh, to take action if uh, there is a violation of the rules. Uh, the pool functions by establishing constraining species quota pound holding accounts and the members transfer their constraining species QP into these holding accounts. So they leave the individual members QP accounts, they move to these holding accounts, and they are held there as available to cover events that qualify. There's a private spatial monitoring and data collection tool that's used for uh, eCatch that was developed by the Nature Conservancy, which also, by the way, contributes indirectly a substantial amount of constraining species quoted to the pool, through uh, agreements it has to make it available to fishermen that participate, that uh, is used to monitor rule compliance. And the element, key element of the entire arrangement is that vessels that comply with the regional rules during an entire fishing trip have their constraining species catch covered by the pool. It's no longer their personal issue. Uh, the Risk Pool Advisory Committee may provide constraining species coverage for a non-compliant vessel, but it has no obligation to do that. There are also audit thresholds, and for example, for yellow eye, it's one fish. If a, <laughs> a boat comes in with one fish on board, before that fish is covered, there's an audit of that vessel's activities during its entire fishing trip to make sure they actually were in compliance with the rules before it is eligible for coverage. Uh, there were concerns that the pool might be any competitive with respect to those outside of the pool, and uh, the pools address that by uh, having an arrangement under which excess, or what's determined to be excess, constraining species quota ponds are released from the pool holding accounts as the committee determines there is surplus. So the benefits, it's addressed the key problems that uh, identified in connection with the constraining species QP allocations. It smooths that distribution, promotes equity, promotes sharing of bycatch information, and that shared bycatch information promotes attainment of target species ACLs, reduces risk of uh, reaching coastwide limits, and it has actually, I believe, contributed to the accelerated rebuilding of constrained species stocks. So, wrapping up, uh, rationalization has indeed reduced the excess harvesting and processing capacity. It has indeed promoted attainment of optimum yield, but it has also in that process evolved to a much more blended and layered combination of government action and private ordering. And I'll say it's time to say the co-management word here. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. That addresses these broader issues of equity and community stability. Uh, looking forward, I think it's important to acknowledge these, uh, these characteristics. I think what we want to, uh, a couple themes that I think are very important at this point. These arrangements are deeply embedded in existing fishery management plans. Consider Amendment 84 or Amendment 91. They are absolutely essential for addressing these complex issues associated with highly dynamic fishery systems because command and control rulemaking is simply not sufficiently adaptive. And the issues that it, uh, councils are asked to address also are not readily susceptible to that type of regulation. You know, the core management issues that we think of are target stock, harvest management, incidental catch management, 
and retention and utilization issues. And the private institutions are addressing all of those. But what, what's going on in the broader sphere is uh, we have concerns from classes of stakeholders who come into the uh, process that include uh, crew members, processors, communities, environmental organizations, seafood distributors, consumer groups, and well, under 303A of MSA, some of those uh, interests are required to be balanced. Uh, the institute, and some aren't even explicitly recognized. The institutions like the councils and the National Marine Fishery Service really have a kind of a questionable capacity to address issues of that kind of complexity and of that character. Uh, on the other hand, what's happening now is that those issues are indeed being addressed through complex layered combinations of institutions, including harvester, processor linkages, price setting formulas and procedures, community quota banks, and privately funded research and development institutions. The fishery cooperatives of the type we're talking about now have explicit roles in connection with addressing every one of those issues. And their performance standards now include uh, promoting new entry and crew, uh, crew participation in the fishery, addressing the potential impacts of quota leasing on crew compensation, and maintaining a fair distribution of fishery resource rent between harvesters and processors. So we've moved to a place where these cooperatives and the character of co-management generally has become very rich and very complex. I think it is time to uh, recognize that this is really an essential MSA tool. And it is time, I think, personally, that the MSA include a, an explicit provision that recognizes co-management as, as the essential component that is, that gives it an, a priority in the sense that it is something that is explicitly con, uh, considered by councils when they're undertaking an FMP development or an FMP amendment or regulatory amendment, both in the sense of whether or not it would be an appropriate tool to be used or if the alternatives being considered would somehow impair it. Now, I wouldn't suggest we tell councils how to go about this process, but I think it's important that it have enough significance in the process that it's actually considered explicitly the way some of these other interests are. And uh, it may be time actually to, perhaps not in this cycle, given how far we are into it, but to consider the possibility that there even be some kind of national standard that actually addresses co-management. I'll stop there.